Okay, good evening and a Freilich and Hanukkah to all. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, as always, our learning should be Lili Nishma, Stanley Grejauer, Nishama Shalab and Aliyah, uh, through the wonderful Midrashah dedicated in her memory and in her honor for all of the wonderful work she did and the uh, impression uh, that she left on all of us. Okay, tonight we're going to continue in the Halacha uh, series uh, theme. And we're going to explore the role of a woman at the Shabbos table. Now, I thought about titling it that, and then I thought much better of it because I value my life. The topic is not the role of a woman at the Shabbos table from any Hashkafic standpoint or from any uh, standpoint of trying to uh, prescribe to women their role. What I want to address is from a halachic perspective, a halachic analysis of the uh, place of a woman or the halachas that pertain to a woman at the Shabbos table. And we're going to try to cover four distinct areas of halacha, We'll see if we have time to get to all four tonight. And that is the halachas of Kiddush. What are the obligations of a woman to hear Kiddush? Opportunities to recite Kiddush? What are halachas vis-a-vis the others at the table regarding Kiddush? The second is Lecha Mishnah. The uh, obligation of making hamotzi on a double portion. Is a woman obligated in Lecha Mishnah? Must she be at the table when the bracha is recited on the Lecha Mishnah? The third area is Zmiros. A woman being able to participate or sing in Zmiros, not if it's a table full of women, that's a very short discussion, but if they're a table with others. And finally, the question of Zimun, not a detailed or comprehensive analysis of the issue of women and Zimun, which is a topic we've discussed before and worthy of exploring, but more specifically, again, a woman's general obligation in Zimun with particular, um, particular attention to being at the table when the Zimun is being recited. It's not to suggest that a woman is, is or should be more likely to not be at the table during these parts of a meal. A man should also be uh, participating in the serving and cleaning and preparing and so on and so forth. But in some homes, sometimes it's taken for granted that for the woman there's a little more flexibility or leeway and therefore she might less be less likely to be present. And we'll explore whether that in fact is a mistake, whether halachically she should be present because these halachas apply equally and are incumbent upon her equally as they are to a man. So let's begin, let's get started with the question of Kiddush, and I invite you, whether you're listening on the Zoom or one of the other platforms, YouTube or or, uh, Facebook, if you have any questions, comments that you want clarification, feel free to share throughout. Let's start with Kiddush. The Gemara Pesachim and Daf Kovav tells us that there is a chiv, an obligation to recite Kiddush immediately when Shabbos begins. Uh, We are Mekadesh, we sanctify Shabbos. There are two ways that Shabbos is sanctified. Passively, it's sanctified when the sun sets, when three stars are visible, then Shabbos has begun. Ready or not, here it comes. Whether you're ready, Shabbos descends upon us, whether we accept it, and whether we are ready for it. But there's a second way we contribute to Shabbos, and that is when we sanctify Shabbos, when we are Mikadesh Shabbos. And we are Mikadesh Shabbos, we sanctify Shabbos by saying Kiddush, by reciting the Kiddush. The Gemara learns this from the Pasuk, Zachor Yam HaShabbos Likad Sho. Likad Sho means that remember Shabbos to sanctify it. We sanctify it, Mishash and Miskadesh Hayom, from the time that the first type of Shabbos, the passive, when Shabbos descends upon us, when that kicks in, from the get there begins or launches the obligation for us to recite Kiddush. And based on this, the Shulchan Aruch Paskins, the Shulchan Aruch records that when returning home from Shul, or if having never gone to Shul, uh, as soon as possible after davening, the Friday night davening, one should recite Kiddush. Parenthetically, this is one of my major pet peeves and hang ups. And it's not just a um, it's not just a hang up because of my appetite or hunger. It's a hang up halachically. One should begin Shabbos. One should recite, rather recite Kiddush as soon as possible to come home from shul or to finish davening and sit on a couch and schmooze or to greet one another to catch up on the whole week and not begin the meal is a mistake. Shalom aleichem, eshes chayil, and Kiddush. We should be mekadesh the day as close as possible to when the day was miskadesh on us when Shabbos began from that day. My second pet peeve is after you make Kiddush, go wash. And this too is a halachic pet peeve. One is supposed to make Kiddush b'makam su'uda. Kiddush should be associated with and recited as part of the as part of the meal. And therefore to make Kiddush and then stand around and schmooze is also a mistake. One should not introduce a break or any kind of delay, but rather recite Kiddush as soon as possible. And after Kiddush, go and wash and continue with the meal as soon as possible. And, please God, we will soon return to normal days when we can eat meals in one another's homes and have so much. We'll have a year to catch up on together. We have the whole meal to catch up together, but the catching up should not happen before Kiddush 
or between Kiddush and the meal. Those should happen uh, expeditiously, efficiently, and then during the meal you have all the time in the world to speak. And that's not just my personal hang-up, that is a halachic consideration and a halachic hang-up as well. This obligation of Kiddush, Zohar, Yom HaShavah, the Kod Show, that we are Mekadesh the day, uh, we make bookends, we recite Kiddush at the beginning to distinguish between the weekday and Shabbos, and we have a bookend at the end called Havdalah that distinguishes between Shabbos and the weekday. Let's start with Kiddush. This obligation of Kiddush, what is the nature of this obligation? So the Rambam Paskins, that Kiddush is a chiv de oraisa. There is a biblical commandment to sanctify the Shabbos day. How does one fulfill that biblical commandment? Bidvarim, with words. When we recite the davening, when we recite the words of Kiddush, not necessarily on a kos, not necessarily on a cup of wine or grape juice, or on challah for that matter, but simply reciting the words. If we verbalize and articulate the distinction, the difference between Shabbos and the day that comes before it and after it, then we have fulfilled Kiddush. To recite Kiddush on a cup of wine or grape juice, or if you don't have it on challah, that is midr that is a that is a rabbinic commandment. So there's a biblical obligation to recite Kiddush. Now, generally speaking, is Kiddush a time-bound mitzvah or not a time-bound mitzvah? The answer is obvious. Kiddush is clearly a time-bound mitzvah. You recite Kiddush on Shabbos. You don't recite Kiddush Friday, and you don't recite Kiddush on Saturday night. You recite Kiddush on Shabbos. It is the very definition or the very example of a time-bound mitzvah. We generally know that women are exempt from time-bound mitzvahs. Women are exempt from mitzvahs of Seisha's man Garama. We've explored this topic as well previously and can explore again why that is. Hashem doesn't want if a woman who may have either in antiquity or today or still tomorrow a primary responsibility to her children and to her home, Hashem says, I never want you to be conflicted between the sun setting and you have to daven mincha and your crying child who needs to be fed dinner or homework or other responsibilities or obligations, which not to suggest that men don't share in those responsibilities, but in the allocation of roles, Hashem says, I will recuse, I will withdraw your obligations towards me so that you never have to feel a tension or a conflict. It's actually brought down in some sources. So why doesn't a single woman or why doesn't a woman with no children have an obligation in time bound mitzvah? Is that the reason? And I saw one answer because, can you imagine if a woman will at one time be obligated in time bound mitzvahs and then by getting married or by having children, she will exempt herself. Maybe she'll delay. Maybe she won't be interested. Maybe she'll be more eager to remain in a position of being obligated in those mitzvahs. Again, Hashem says, the choice between the two, I'm out. I don't want you to have that tension. I don't want you to have that conflict. I don't want you to have that choice. So generally speaking, we have a principle that women are exempt from mitzvahs. Say, Shazman, Groma. They're exempt from time-bound mitzvahs based on a Gemara in Brachos. So the question is, what about Kiddush? Kiddush, we just said, is a time-bound mitzvah. The time of Kiddush is on Friday night. That's the biblical obligation of Kiddush. Kiddush Shabbos Day is what we call Kiddusha Rabbah. Kiddush Shabbos Day is a sort of imitation of Kiddush. Kiddusha Rabbah is a euphemism. The great, the grand Kiddush really is a euphemism because it's not much of a Kiddush at all. If you think about it, what's the whole Kiddush on Shabbos Day? Bore Pri Hagafen. That's it. How is that different than when you want to have a glass of wine on a Monday night? It's not. It's a Birch HaSanen. It's a bracha you say before a cup of wine or a cup of grape juice. It's just that we say it before we make hamotzi, so that Shabbos lunch is clearly Shabbos lunch. If you didn't do that, if you washed and you made hamotzi, and then you had a cup of wine during the meal and made a bori priyagafen, what would distinguish Shabbos lunch from Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday lunch? It would look like any other lunch. In order to make it look like a different lunch, we make the bori priyagafen before the hamotzi. We do it out of order. That is a rabbinic commandment, a rabbinic fulfillment, the Kiddush on Shabbos Day, what we call Kiddush Rabba. The real Kiddush, the grand Kiddush, the Kiddush that's referenced from the Pasuk that we derive from the verse, is on Friday night. So again, even though generally speaking women are exempt from time-bound mitzvahs, when it comes to Kiddush, women are obligated. And where does that obligation come from? The Gemara Brachos Navchaf tells us. Because the mitzvah of Shabbos appears many times in the Torah, but as part of the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, it appears in two places in Parshas Yisro and in Parshas Va'eschanan. And we have an important difference, an important distinguished distinction between the two places where it appears. Once it says, Zachor es Yom HaShabbos L'Kadcho, and the other time it says, Shamor es Yom HaShabbos L'Kadcho, that's why Shlomo Akabetz was able to begin L'Chadodi, Shamor v'Zachor b'Dibor Echad. It was said simultaneously. Which one did God utter? It appears twice in the Torah, and we have two different versions of what was said, but it only happened historically once. So which one did God say? Did he say Zachor? Did he say Shamor? And the answer is, yes. He said both. 
Zacha v'shamar b'dibur echad, we don't have that ability. We are unable to pronounce two different things simultaneously. Then it will be jarbled. It'll be it'll be uh, all jumbled. But Hashem has that unique ability. They were said today together. Zacha v'shamar b'dibur echad. So the Gemara there derives the following. The Gemara there says anyone who's obligated in the shamor. If you're obligated in the negative commandments of Shabbos, if you're obligated to rest from the 39 categories of creative labor, you're obligated to make Shabbos different by not doing malachas machshevas, by not engaging in creative labor, by being at rest and at peace with nature and with the world around us. Whomever is obligated in Shamor, in the negative part of Shabbos, is equally obligated in Zachor, the positive. So since women are included in the prohibition of Shamor, women too are bound by the 39 categories of creative labor, they can't do malacha on Shabbos, therefore they too are included in the positive of Zachor, of reciting Kiddush. What is the nature of a woman's obligation? A man are obligated in Kiddush, we said, De'araisa, biblically, from the Pasuk, Zachor, Siyama, Shabbos, Le'kad Show. Remember the Shabbos day to sanctify it. What about women? So the Mishnah Bur is clear, Shachanar is clear, Mishnah Bur is clear, that women share a mitzvah De'araisa. That the Gemara's limud, that which the Gemara learned to say, whoever is obligated in the negative is equally obligated in the positive, means that positive obligation is biblical, de'araisa, on the same level as men. And based on this, the Mishnah Bura says that since a woman carries the same obligation as a man, technically speaking, she could recite Kiddush too. She could be Motzi the man. She could say Kiddush and fulfill Kiddush for the man. However, the Mishnah Bura does add that a woman should only be motzi men who are b'nei besa in her home. That this is considered, at least traditionally, a role and responsibility of the man. And if a man would need to depend on the woman to say Kiddush for him, which might suggest that he's illiterate or he's incapable, then that would reflect poorly on him. So the custom is for men to say Kiddush, but strictly speaking, there'd be nothing wrong with a woman saying Kiddush and being motzi men. And in a situation where a woman uh, doesn't uh, is not have a man to be motzi her, a woman who lives alone, a woman whose husband is out of town, a woman who's, uh, who's not married, certainly there's nothing wrong with her reciting Kiddush for herself. She has a biblical commandment, and she can be Yotzei that Kiddush. Now we come upon a technical problem, which is, when the man is in shul, he's already said Kiddush. How has he said Kiddush when he's in shul? Because in shul we say the paragraph of Vayichulu as part of davening. Vayichulu HaShemayim Va'ar, it's familiar to us as the first paragraph of Kiddush, is actually part of the davening itself. That means that the man, by the time he comes home from shul, has fulfilled the biblical obligation to remember the day. All that's left is the rabbinic obligation to do so on a cup of wine, to give the meal distinction, to give the meal great dignity, to elevate the meal by making a blessing on the wine before the hamotzi. The biblical obligation was fulfilled in shul. What's left is the rabbinic obligation. For one second, what, what about if he's married and his wife is at the table, and let's assume she didn't daven mar, she didn't say vayichulu, so she maintains a biblical obligation. How can someone who's obligated rabbinically, the man who recited Kiddush and Shul, when he said Vayichulu, how can he be motzi? how can he fulfill the biblical obligation of the woman? This is an age-old question, it's brought up by the Bir Halacha, and it is discussed by the Prima Godim. The Prima Godim says, we have a principle called Arvus, that Kol uh, Yisrael Arevim Zebazeh, we're all responsible one for another. That means that even somebody who already fulfilled the biblical obligation can be motzi somebody who has not. So for example, someone who has heard the Megillah can read the Megillah and say a bracha on it for someone who hasn't heard it. Someone who's heard the shofar can blow the shofar and make a bracha on it for somebody who hasn't heard it. All midin arvus, the idea that if there's a Jew in my circle, in my surrounding, who has not yet uh, been yotze a mitzvah, then I haven't been yotze a mitzvah. In other words, yes, I fulfilled the mitzvah, but if there's a Jew for whom I can help fulfill the mitzvah, then there's a piece of me that has not fulfilled the mitzvah. So that principle of arvas, of kol Yisrael arivim zebazeh, the primi gadim suggests that's what's at work. That the man, true, he was already yotzei the deoraisa in shul when he said vayichulu, and he comes home to find a woman or children over bar bat mitzvah who are obligated still deoraisa, he can fulfill that midin arvas, he can be motzi the midin arvas. But there's another answer and another explanation based on Rabbi Kiva Eger. Rabbi Kiva Eger, and this is quoted by the Muggen of Ram, Rabbi Kiva Eger is of the following opinion. How are you Yotze this mitzvah d'araisa of Kiddush? We said that biblically speaking, you're obligated to recite Kiddush. How is one fulfilled that biblical obligation to recite Kiddush? Again, on a cup is the Rabbanan, to articulate it, to recite it with words, 
That is what is Deoraisa. What do you have to say in order to fulfill the Deoraisa obligation of Kiddush to make the day different than every other day? Do you have to say the words to Vayichulu? Do you have to say the words to Yom HaShishi? Do you have to say, what do you have to say? So Rabbi Kiv Eger says, you know what you can say to fulfill Kiddush Deoraisa, biblically speaking? Good Shabbos. If you turn to someone else, if you even just say out loud, oh, good Shabbos. Should be a Geshmak Shabbos. A good Shabbos. Shabbat Shalom. However you want to say it. But if you acknowledge today is Shabbos, says Rabbi Kiva Eger, you've been Yotze Kiddush. To fulfill the biblical commandment, you don't have to recite a text, you don't have to recite some uh, ritual liturgy, but simply saying the words, Good Shabbos, announcing out loud that this day is different than others, is how you fulfill the mitzvah de Orisa, which has several significant um, applications. Number one, for a man too, you fulfill uh, Kiddush when you say Good Shabbos. There are those opinions, by the way, Let's say you're walking to shul and you say good Shabbos to someone else, even though you're not yet ready to accept Shabbos. Some suggest you might have just accepted Shabbos and you can't have mincha anymore. However, we don't really follow that opinion because clearly in that context, you don't mean to sanctify Shabbos. You haven't even done the mincha. You haven't taken the keys out of your pocket yet. However, it is significant because it means that if you have a neighbor who's not religious, who's not going to be saying Kiddush, but you get them to answer you good Shabbos, you help them fulfill a biblical commandment. They have fulfilled the mitzvah del rice of Kiddush. It also means that if a husband walks through the door and his wife and he are hopefully speaking and they greet and wish one another a good Shabbos, now they're both on the same level playing field. It all depends on what the Arab Shabbos was like. But hopefully now they've greeted each other, all is forgiven, they lit candles, shalom bias, the malachim escort them home, the malachim are happy with what they see, and they wish one another a good Shabbos. So now if a woman, if the wife has said good Shabbos, she has fulfilled the biblical commandment too, now they're on an equal playing field and now one can be Yotzei the other. The last thing in this area, and then we'll uh, move on, of Kiddush is another fascinating practical application when it comes to a child. And this might be somewhat counterintuitive. Who should be Yotze the mitzvah for whom when there is a child? So let's say a father's out of town, he is on a business trip, he's unavailable, you have a single mom who's living with her kids, and now she has a bar mitzvah child. So first of all, if her children are all under bar mitzvah, should her 11, 12 year old son fulfill Kiddush for her? No, clearly not. She's obligated biblically. He's only obligated rabbinically. He's not yet bar mitzvah. She should be the one to recite Kiddush. What about after his bar mitzvah? He's turned 13. And now dad's out of town or dad's out of the picture. Should the bar mitzvah boy say Kiddush consistently for the mom? Or should the mom say Kiddush? So the Mishnah Bura says the following. He says, very interesting. A bar mitzvah boy, in order to become the age of mitzvahs, you need two things. Shonam v'simanim. You need to reach the age of majority. You need to reach 13 years for a boy, 12 years for a girl. And you also need what we call simanim. You need the signs of puberty, the signs that you've reached the age of, of, uh, of uh, maturity. So a 13-year-old boy, how do we know? How do we know that in fact he's bar mitzvah? His mother can produce his birth certificate to tell us he's reached the shanim, the years. But how do we know that he's reached the, the uh, simanim? So the answer is we don't. We rely on a chazaka. We have a principle that we assume that most 13-year-old boys and most 12-year-old girls not only have reached the age of majority, but we assume they also show the signs of the age of majority. And we rely on that. But that chazaka, that which we rely on, that assumption, is that assumption allow us to rely on that biblically or rabbinically? When does that come up? Several cases. What if a bar mitzvah boy is reading Parsha Zachor? When a bar mitzvah boy is reading any other Parsha, so Torah reading on Shabbos is rabbinic. Ezra... The prophet Ezra, Moshe established Monday, Thursday, and Shabbos. We don't go three days, excuse me, without reading Torah. However, one parsha we read is not rabbinic, it's biblical, and that is Parshas Zachor, the commandment to remember what Amalek did to us. So we follow the opinion that a bar mitzvah boy should not read Parsha Zachor, the end of Kiseitse, on the Shabbos before Purim. Why? Because unless that bar mitzvah boy is already shaving, unless that bar mitzvah boy already very visibly and clearly we can confirm has not only the years of majority, but the signs of majority, then that bar mitzvah boy should not be yotze other people, motzi other people, in a biblical commandment. Says the Mishnah Bura, the same is true when it comes to Kiddush. The mother's obligated to Raisa, and this bar mitzvah boy, not under bar mitzvah, even a bar mitzvah boy, assuming his mustache has not yet come in, this bar mitzvah boy um, is only, uh, we're working off the assumption, the chazaka, that he has reached the age and the signs of maturity. And therefore, in a conflict between the two, the mother should make the Kiddush 
not even this newly minted bar mitzvah boy. The last comment I'll make on Kiddush in terms of a woman's obligation or responsibility. So far we saw there's a biblical obligation in Kiddush. Women are equally obligated. Technically a woman could be mozi men. The custom traditionally is that men are the ones who fulfill Kiddush. But if no man is available or proficient or around, certainly a woman can say Kiddush for herself and for others. And it's preferable for her to say it over a minor. She's obligated biblically, they rabbinically. And even over a newly minted bar mitzvah boy, preferable for the woman to make Kiddush, she's obligated to Arisa. And in the case of the bar mitzvah boy, relying on a chazaka and only obligated dira banan. How do you uh, overcome this notion that when the husband comes home, he's only obligated to Rabbanan, she's still Doraisa? One of two ways, either Midin Arvas, it's working that one can fulfill the other, or if she has said good Shabbos to somebody, she too has fulfilled the biblical commandment, biblical obligation of uh, Kiddush, and now they're on an equal playing field. But the last comment I'll make is that it's very important. This is uh, something people neglect, they don't necessarily know. It's very important that whoever's reciting Kiddush and is assumed to be Motzi others, there should be that communication, either implicit or explicit, that the one being Mekadesh, the one saying Kiddush, says, I am helping fulfill for all those who are present. And those who are present say, please have you in mind, I would like to be Yotze with you. In order for it to work, the one reciting Kiddush has to have in mind the listeners, and the listeners have to have in mind to be Yotze with the one who is saying it. So it's very, very important. You know, sometimes in some homes, you know, a woman might still be in the kitchen plating the first course, and her husband is starting Kiddush. He's given up. He's out of time. He's lost his patience. So she says, start without me. I'll be there in a second. And she misses the beginning of Kiddush. That is a no-no for lots of reasons, but also because she is equally obligated in Kiddush. Kiddush, out of respect, certainly, but out of halacha also, should not begin until all are present. And that is the role of a woman in terms of obligation in Kiddush. Even though it's a mitzvah of Groma, it's an exception to the rule. Those who are obligated in Shamor, those who are obligated in the 39 categories of creative labor are also obligated in Shamor, in the positive commandment of Kiddush. Okay, all of that is number one. Our last thing, what about eating before Kiddush? Your husband is taking forever to come home from shul. He's the rabbi, and everybody says good Shabbos, and he catches up and schmoozes with every congregant, and it's taking forever to come home, and you are dying of thirst. Can you taste something? Can you drink something before hearing Kiddush? And the answer is no. There's one exception, which is if you've accepted early Shabbos and it's still before Shkia, then some will say that you can take a drink if you're particularly parched. But if it's after Shkia, if it's after the time that Shabbos has fallen upon us, even if we haven't accepted it, it has accepted us, once Shkia, once sunset arrives, then you're not allowed to eat or drink before reciting Kiddush. And even a cup of water would fall into that. Now I'm not talking about somebody who is so parched and so thirsty that it's life-threatening or dangerous, just talking about somebody who says, I'm really thirsty, I could use some water. You're not allowed to eat or drink before hearing Kiddush. Okay, let's move over to the second area. And the second area is the question of Lechem Mishnah. Is a woman obligated in Lechem Mishnah? Many women are the ones who provide or bake the Lechem Mishnah and bake so beautifully and wonderfully delicious chalas, um, but are they obligated themselves in Lechem Mishnah? What does that mean to be obligated in Lechem Mishnah? How do you fulfill Lechem Mishnah that we're even talking about what it means to be obligated in it? So the Torah tells us that in the Midbar, in the desert, there were two portions of man that fell from heaven. We know that in our journeys through the desert, we, uh, the bread miraculously didn't grow from the ground, but rather the manna, the man fell from heaven. And the Torah tells us that on Friday, a double portion fell. Because it didn't fall on Shabbos, on Friday, a double portion fell, enough for Friday and for Shabbos. And the Gemara on Shabbos, the Kofi Yudzayin Rebbez, learns from here the obligation to take Lechem Mishnah on Shabbos. That just like the double portion fell in the desert, we commemorate that double portion falling by engaging a double portion on Shabbos, lechem bread, Mishnah double, a double portion of bread at the meal. So the question is, what is the nature of this? Is lechem Mishnah, is having a double portion of bread, two whole loaves, right? We don't just have a slice of bread. We don't have one pita or one lachmania or one chala. We have two. What is the nature of that obligation to have lechem Mishnah? So the Magan Avram, Rav Avram Gambiner says, it's a mitzvah dirabanan. It's a rabbinic commandment. The Pasuk's an asmachta. Really, it's true this happened in the desert. And we rabbinically want to commemorate the miracle in the desert of the man falling. And therefore, on Shabbos, just like the double portion fell on Friday, we engage a double portion on Shabbos to commemorate that miracle. The Aruch HaShulchan of Yechiel Michal Epstein says, No, the mitzvah of Lechem Mishnah is a din de oraisa. It is a biblical commandment. It is a biblical commandment. What is the nature of this commandment? 
So the Gemara says, Chayev Lefzoa, Botseya. And the word Botseya is unclear exactly what it means. Does the word Botseya mean to make the bracha on two loaves? Or does it mean to cut into two loaves? So Rashi is of the opinion that Botseya means you make a bracha on the two, but then you cut one. So Friday night you have two loaves, you make a bracha on two, and then you cut one, you can save the other loaf for the next day. Lunch you have two, you make a bracha on two, you cut one, you save it um, if you want for Shalashivas. So Rashi says the notion of being, um, of, uh, of uh, the way we fulfill of uh, Botseya, Botseya doesn't mean they have to cut into it, Botseya means that you make the bracha on it. That's the opinion of Rashi. Which challah do you cut if you only cut one? So our custom is Friday night we cut the bottom challah, Shabbos day we cut the top challah, we put one challah on top of the other, and we cover it with the tablecloth, with the um, challah cover rather. Not for tonight, it's a whole great discussion. We have several reasons why we have the custom of covering the challah with lots of nafkaminas, practical differences between those reasons. But the proper thing is that we put one challah on top of the other, the bottom challah sticking out closer to us, so we're not skipping over the top one. We make the bracha with our hands on both of them under the challah cover, lifting them all ten fingers. The bracha of Hamotzi has ten words, all ten fingers, pre-corona, all ten fingers on the two challahs, and then we cut the bottom challah. Why do we cut the bottom challah? It has to do with Kabbalistic reasons of intimacy, of romance between us and Hashem, between us and Shabbos, uh, not for not for now. So we cut one. So Rashi says that the, the notion of Lecha Mishnah and the notion of Botseya applies to the bracha we recite. The Rashba of Shmuel ben Adar, Shlomo ben Adaris, the Rashba, one of the great Spanish commentaries, medieval commentary, says no, the notion of being Botseya doesn't just mean making the bracha on two and then cutting one, it means that we cut two. You may have seen some people of the custom putting two chalas one on top of the other and they cut all the way through the top chala and all the way through the bottom chala. That is the opinion of the Rashba. How do we follow? So the Shulchan Aruch says we follow Rashi. You make the bracha on two, and you only cut one. The bottom one Friday night, the top one Shabbos day. However, the Gra, the Vilna Gon, followed the opinion of the Rashba. And the Vilna Gon said you cut all the way straight through two. Many uh, Litvaks and many others follow this Gra. You see some people have the custom of the Gra. They don't cut one chala, they cut all the way straight through the two chalas. There's a third opinion, the Arizal. The Arizal didn't just have two chalas, the Arizal had 12 chalas. Two big chalas and 10 little chala rolls. If you've been to the Tish of the great Hasidah Sherebbe, you'll see that the great Rebbe's also follow this, and they have 12 chalas at each meal on Shabbos. Two big loaves and 10 little loaves. Lachem Hapanim, it commemorates other, other um, uh, great miracles that occurred with bread. So the Shulchan says we follow Rashi, you only have to cut one. The Vilna Gon and those who have the custom cut two. The Ari even went so far as having 12. What is the machlokas? What's the debate between Rashi and the Rajba? Whether you cut one or cut two? So it's been explained by some. The Rashi's of the opinion that Lecha Mishnah Zecher Laman. Rashi's of the opinion that Lecha Mishnah commemorates the double portion that fell in the desert. So how do we commemorate the double portion? By having that same double portion present at each of the times that we make Hamotzi. You don't have to actually cut both. You only need to cut one. However, the Rashba's of the opinion that no. What it's commemorating is double. The idea that Shabbos, we have a single portion. Uh, sorry, weekday, we have a single portion. Shabbos, ooh, Shabbos, you have a double portion. In order to show that Shabbos, you're enjoying and benefiting from the double portion, then you don't just cut the one, you cut two over each meal of Shabbos. That is a machlokas. Several nafkamina, several practical differences. One nafkamina is, do you need to have Lechem Mishnah at Shalashudas? We all know that you have two loaves Friday night and two loaves Shabbos day. What about the third meal? I should have actually put that on this list. Women are also obligated in Shabbos Shiras, and they should not neglect the mitzvah of Shabbos Shiras. I didn't even put it on this list to discuss today. Maybe we'll have to do it another time. But women also should enjoy. The Raiva the Raiva, the holiest meal of the whole work, of the whole week, Shabbos Shiras. It's a very, very holy time. So do you have to have the double portion? So the Ramah says no. The Rambam, the Shulchan Aruch say, it's preferable, yes, have that double portion. And they could be arguing along the same lines of what is the role of Lecha Mishnah? What is the mitzvah of Lecha Mishnah? Is it commemorative of how it fell in the desert? Or is it to experience a double portion on Shabbos? Good. All of this was by way of leading up to the question of women. Are women obligated in Lechem Mishnah? And again, this is very important. Sometimes the woman will wash or be the last to wash or still be in the kitchen or still taking care of something when hamotzi is being made. And when she comes to the table, she's only there in order to get a sliced bread. She's not tapping into the shleimos, the complete loaves of bread. 
she wasn't there when the hamotzi was made on the lechem mishnah on the double portion. Are women obligated in lechem mishnah? Why would you think they should be exempt? For the same reason, one would have thought they'd be exempt from kiddush. Lechem mishnah is a mitzvah zaseh shazman grama. Lechem mishnah is a time-bound mitzvah because it only applies on Shabbos. There's no mitzvah of lechem mishnah on Monday night. It only applies on Shabbos. That is the very definition of time-bound. So if it's a time-bound mitzvah, one might have, might have anticipated women will be exempt. However, the Ran, Rabbi Nisim, says no. Women are obligated in Lecha Mishnah. Why are women obligated in Lecha Mishnah? Because just like we learned from the Gemara Brachos, whoever is obligated in Shamor is obligated in Zachor, whoever has to abstain and refrain and rest from the 39 categories of creative labor also has to fulfill the positive commandment of Kiddush. So the Ran says, just like Kiddush is a positive commandment, of distinguishing and differentiating Shabbos, so to Lecha Mishnah, the double portion, is a positive way of honoring Shabbos. And just like women were obligated in Kiddush, because they're obligated in Shamor, they're obligated not to do the 39 categories of creative labor, so to they're obligated in Lecha Mishnah for the very same reason. That's the Ran. Rabbeinu Tam gives a different reason, and it's relevant to Hanukkah, in which we find ourselves, a Freilich and Hanukkah to all. The Rabbeinu Tam, Balei Atosos, the grandson of Rashi, Rabbeinu Tam says, Women are obligated in Lecha Mishnah. You know why? Af hein hayu ba'oso hanis. Why are women obligated in Hanukkah candles? It's a time-bound commandment. It only applies at night, and it only applies from the 25th of Kislev for eight days. Why are women obligated in Hanukkah? Because af hein hayu ba'oso hanis. They were, and this is a debate, Rashi and Tosos, doesn't mean they were included in the salvation, it doesn't mean they were the catalyst and the cause of the salvation. But either way, women are obligated because they too were in the miracle. Similarly, Megillah. Women have to hear the Megillah on Purim. Why? Time-bound mitzvah. The answer is, Afena yuba'oso anes. They too were in the miracle. So Rabbeinu Tam says, the same is true when it comes to, when it comes to Lecha Mishnah. Since women also benefited from the falling of the double portion of Man, they too were the beneficiaries of the mitzvah, of the miracle. Afena yuba'oso anes. Women are also obligated in Lecha Mishnah. Now this is a little bit more complicated. It's a little bit more complicated because the principle of Afein Ayubo Anes generally only applies to rabbinic commandments. We don't find Afein applying to biblical commandments. Hanukkah and Purim, we don't find it applying to a biblical commandment. If you assume Lecha Mishnah is biblical, then it's hard to understand why women would be obligated based on Afein Ayubo Anes. There's a lot to say about that, but not for now. What is the conclusion? The Mishnah Bura and the Arach HaShulchan and the Yalkut Yosef, Yechav Adas for Sephardim, Ravad Yosef, all say that women are drum roll please, obligated in Lechem Mishnah. That means to say again, what's a woman's place at the table? It's at the table. The woman's equally obligated in Kiddush. She must be present. Technically, she can be the one to recite Kiddush. The woman is equally obligated in Lechem Mishnah. Technically, she can be the one to say Hamotzi. Traditionally, it is the man, but a woman is equally obligated in these things, be it Kiddush at first, and secondly, be it, be it Lechem Mishnah, to commemorate the miracle of the man, a woman as well is is obligated. Okay, moving over to Zmiros. This is a topic I'll just gloss over, um, the question of Zmiros. A woman is sitting at the table. Can she, should she, may she sing and participate in the singing of, in the singing of Zmiros? So this is a discussion, part of a bigger topic of Kol Isha. Why is it a problem of Kol Isha? Well, if it's the immediate family of the woman, then of course she can and should participate, sing out loud, sing harmony, sing however she would like to. If it's her own family, absolutely she can, she should. It'd be a beautiful contribution to the symphony of song, to the harmony produced by the family at the table. The question is, what if there are men to whom she is not related, who are present? May she sing Zmiros then. So generally speaking, we have a prohibition uh, called Kol Isha. The Gemara tells us um, that the voice of a woman is a form of, a, of an erva. It can be seductive. It can be provocative. It can... Uh, uh, it can cause uh, a man to be aroused. And the Gemara therefore lists it and includes it among the things that require a sense, of, a sense of modesty. And we know that that's true today. There are female singers who, um, aside from their physique, can use their voice in a way which is uh, drawing, a lot of, drawing a lot of attention, not just to the quality of the voice, but in a much more seductive or provocative way. So we have a principle, we have a halacha, called kol bi'isha erva. It's a Gemara in Kedushin, kol bi'isha erva. Um, Shulchan Arach Paskins this way, or Chaim Simon Ayin Hey, Yeshli Zar Mishmias Kol 
Zemer Isha B'Shas Kriya Shema. The person is reciting Shema. You're saying a Dabr Shabitusha. You're saying a holy. Uh, you're saying a holy uh, um, recitation. A person has to be careful not to do so in the presence of any erva, someone who's not dressed properly, a man or a woman, or in the presence of a of a voice of a uh, of a woman, which also has the status of an erva. So we know that's true if a woman is singing a non-Jewish or a non ritualistic and non-holy uh, type of song. Does it also equally apply, apply if the woman is singing a song of Shire Kodesh? If a woman is singing Zmiros, would it apply? So there's literature about this. Again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this right now. I'll just share with you one piece of literature, halachic literature on the subject, uh, made famous or most famous um, of the, the tshuva of the Sri Deish. The Sri Deish, Rabbi Yechiel Yaakov Weinberg, a great godol, who was in Europe and in Switzerland, and he wrote a tshuva to a youth movement like what we would call NCSY today, where NCSY wanted to know, could they have a shalashiris? Could they have a kumzitz? Could NCSY have a davening? Where the young men and young women, the teenagers who are part of this youth movement, meant to inspire them, could they sing together, even though the women's voices will be discernible? And again, now is not the time, but if, if it's a multiplicity of women singing together, so you cannot recognize any of those voices in isolation, one way to avoid kol isha. So the Sri Daesh um, rules on this matter, and he says the following, it's in his Chelek Evan Ezer Simen Ein Zayin. And he says the following, He was talking about Yeshurun was the NCSY of, of its day. They may rely on the great authorities of Ashkenaz. Who understood pedagogy, education, inspiration. They understood to the young women of the generation the importance for them to be exposed to the energy of singing, of Shabbos, of Ruach, of spirit. And therefore they allowed women to participate with singing Shabbos Miros. We see that the Gedolei Ashkenaz were successful in producing inspiration in the next generation. So other lands where they were more strict on this matter were not as successful as inspiring the next generation. Those who were not less strict, but those who understood that Zmiros Kodesh, they understood Shire Kodesh, that holy songs, even sung by a woman, will not be done so seductively or provocatively. And therefore, he writes, there is a heter that can be relied upon for women to sing in the context of Zmiros, even in front of men they are not related to. That is the opinion of the Sri Daesh. It's one opinion, and it's certainly authoritative opinion, and upon uh, opinion upon whom we or one can most certainly unapologetically rely. However, there is also another opinion that says that kol, kol isha would apply in that context, and that in a mixed company, a woman should be as careful, man should be as careful about kol isha as they, uh, as they would, even in the context outside of shirei kodesh. I'll just move on from this with uh, sharing a historical uh, footnote on it. In the book, uh, Making of a Gadol, it tells a story regarding this subject. And it says the following. Um, tells the following story in a footnote. Where is it? Yeah. Um, ba, ba, ba. In the early 1930s, in the early 1930s, um, who is the protagonist that we're talking about? Who was invited? Uh, he was invited to spend Shabbos at the home of the Rav of Elizabeth, New Jersey, Rav Elazar Mayor Prail. Before the arrival of the Shabbos, the Rav took him aside for a confidential exchange of words. He told his guests that he had several daughters eating at the Shabbos table who enjoyed Shabbos by singing Zmiros along with him. At this point in the narrative, this is Rabbi Ruderman, the Rosh of Ner Yisrael. Rabbi Ruderman interjected that there were no uh, Isakos at the time and so on. The Rav told him that Rav Baruch Ber Leibovitz had been a guest at his home in 1929, and when the girls began singing, he stood up and ran out of the room, unintentionally perturbing the Shabbos for the girls and humiliating their father. The host then asked, Rabbi Prel then asked whether Rabbi Ruderman would do the same. Rabbi Ruderman replied that with his Slobodka background, he would not destroy the family's Shabbos spirit or embarrass his host. He would remain sitting and not listen to the girls. And uh, despite the seeming normative halachic imperative to leave the room, my firm kite does not have to hurt others, he concluded. An interesting, uh, an interesting example of this historically between Rabbi Baruch Baer and Rav Ruderman and Rabbi Prail, Rabbi Taitz's father-in-law. So there are distant customs. One can rely on the Sri Daesh if they like. There are those who are strict and who do not rely on it as well. Okay, our last subject, which is Zimun. The last subject is the concept of Zimun. What is the concept of Zimun? So, the notion of benching with a Zimun is mentioned in the Mishnah in Brachos. The Mishnah there says, If three people eat together, 
they have an obligation not simply to recite benching to themselves, but by combining and collaborating on their benching, then they raise that benching to another level, so to say, and they add the zimun component. When we think of zimun, think of Rabbi Sain of Arech, the invitation to bench together. Gemara quotes two different sukkim as the source of this mitzvah of zimun, either Gadul Hashem Iti and Ram Yachtov, or Kishem Hashem Akra Havu Gadul Lukeinu. Either one of those psukim, it's two opinions in the Gemara, which one is the source of this mitzvah to recite benching with a zimun. Is it Doraisa or Dirabanan? Is it a biblical commandment or a rabbinic commandment? The Ravid holds that zimun, the institution of zimun, benching collaboratively is biblical, whereas the Me'iri and the Ritva hold it is Dirabanan, it is rabbinic. Why do we have it? So the Me'iri writes, because when a person benches zimun, you're going to concentrate more. When you collaborate, when you do it together as a community, you're going to concentrate more on your expression of gratitude for the meal that you just had. Your benching will take on a higher level. The Ritva says, no, that's not the reason. The Ritva says, when you bench with the zimun, you're honoring Hashem. We don't do things independently when you can do it collaboratively. When you do it collaboratively and you do it as a sense of a community, then you elevate it beyond just the individuals and you show greater honor to Hashem by doing it together. How do you do zimun? So the Shulchan Aruch says, and this was true through the time of the Shulchan Aruch, that the real way you do zimun is only one person benches. The individual who is honored with leading the benching recites the Rabbi Sainav Arech, invites others, and when others give him permission, they give rishus, then the one person says all of benching out loud, everyone else doesn't say benching, they simply answer amen at the end of each bracha of benching, and then they've done it together, similar to a chazar sashat. Just the mezameh, just the one leading the zimun says everything out loud, and everyone listens passively and only answers amen. The Mishnah Bura says, today we have collective ADD. We'd never be able to do it. To sit and listen to someone at bench the whole time and concentrate every word they're saying, it'll never happen. And that's why we today recite the benching together alongside the mezameh, together with the person who is, who is leading the, who's leading the benching. Now, do women make a zimun? If three men eat together, then they make a zimun. What about three women who are eating together? Do they make a zimun? So the Gemara in Erechen sounds like yes, while the Gemara in Bracha sounds like no, they don't. So how do you reconcile these two Gemaras that seem to contradict one another, whether when women, three women eat together, they should make a zimun? So Tosu says, you know how you reconcile it? Unlike when three men eat together, they're obligated in zimun. If three women eat together, it's optional to have a zimun. So one Gemara says yes, women zimun. The other says no. It's not a contradiction. When it comes to men, if three men eat together, you're obligated. If three women eat together, you're not obligated. It is optional. The Beis Yosef says, no, that's not what it means. Women participating in zimun, that's what's obligated. Meaning, if three men are making a zimun, and there's a woman who ate with them, she must answer their zimun. That's what the Gemara said, meant when it said women and zimun. Not a woman's zimun, but a woman answering a man's zimun. That's what the Gemara meant, and that is how it's not a contradiction. The rush is of the opinion that three women who eat together are obligated to make their own zimun. Are obligated to make their own zimun. Why might they not be obligated? Again, we said this is a much bigger discussion and we are running out of time, so I'm going to cut to the bottom line. Can women and men combine for a zimun together? Rashi says no. The Mishnah Buddha says it wouldn't be modest. We pass in the Shulchan Aruch that they cannot combine to make a zimun together. So what should women do in practice? Should they make their own zimun or not? The Aruch HaShulchan says he never heard of women making a zimun. If you look at the art scroll, Women's Sitter, it does not include a woman's zimun. The Shulchan Aruch Harav, the Alter Rebbe, and the Ben Ishchai say women should make a zimun. The Groh, the Vilna Gon, held that three women are obligated to make a zimun. So should they, should they not? We have different traditions. Ask your local Orthodox rabbi, or women should ask their mothers and grandmothers what the custom is in their home. Do women make a zimun or not? By the way, Rav Zilberstein, the three day, the um, Chashuk Echemed, Rav Zilberstein and Rav Shlomo Zalman Arbach both say that, let's say there are three women eating with one man. So the women are making a zimun. Should the man answer the woman's zimun? Rav Shlomo Zalman Arbach and Rav Zilberstein both say yes. Once the women are making a zimun, if they're following those opinions, it's a bona fide zimun, and a man, of course, should answer, should answer that zimun. Why am I raising this as our last subject for tonight? Because we paskin explicitly in the Shulchan Aruch that women are obligated, if not obligated to make their own zimun, women are obligated to be Yotze Zimun. That means to say that, and this comes up very often also, where they're ready to bench and say, honey, let's bench. Says, go ahead without me. I can hear you from here. I'm still clearing up. I'm still putting things away. I'm still taking care of whatever. No, the benching with a Zimun should not happen until all women are at the table. 
Because even if it's a men's zimun, zimun, women are obligated to hear the zimun of the men. That is how we paskin. So what we saw on all these subjects, Kiddush, women are equally obligated to men. Lacha Mishnah, women are equally obligated to men. Zimun, women are equally obligated not to make a zimun, but to yotze, if a zimun is being made, to hear it as men. And therefore, what's a woman's place at the Shabbos table? Right alongside the man, making sure that she is present in order to fully experience not only the wonderful work and the effort, and the backbreaking labor and the selfless investment of, of spirituality she has put into making Shabbos, she should reap the spiritual reward and benefit of being there to experience and be enriched by all of these many, many halachas of Shabbos as well. We'll continue with this uh, theme at some point in the future. Thank you for joining. Wishing everyone a Freilich and Chanukah. Have a wonderful night. Stay happy, stay healthy, and stay holy.